Well, hello, folks out there in YouTube land. Got a big show lined up for you. Let's get right on into it. All right. Yeah, this is the most exciting season in many, many years. We're going to talk about spring practice, recruiting, and uh, Pat McAfee has taken over ESPN. So we're going to get into a whole lot of stuff. Now, I didn't do a show yesterday. I got home after work. I was tired, and I just wasn't in the mood. Now, you listen to me. You're not in the mood? Well, you get in the mood. <laughs> yep, yep. But now I am in the mood. So let's get into this. Now, there's so much going on this year, 2024. I think it's going to be the greatest college year ever. And before you say, well, how do you know that? How do you, where are you coming up with that nonsense? I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's the 12-team playoff. There are going to be so many teams that are going to be involved in this all the way up to the last few weeks. Normally, once you get two losses, especially in the SEC, which is super easy to do, you're gone. Goodbye. You're out of the playoff talk. You can't even think about it. But with 12 teams, that's a different animal. You still have a very legit shot, especially depending on who the two losses are against. Now, the teams that should be most excited about this playoff situation – I would start with the Tennessee Vols, number one. But I tell you, there's a lot of other teams that should be just as excited. The old misses of the world. Missouri, for example. Even a Kentucky, who has won 10 games in a year, many times, under uh, Mark Stoops or Mike Stoops. I never can keep up with all the Stoopses. But there are teams out there that can win 10 games. And the Penn States of the world, you should be thrilled. In the ACC, Clemson, if you have a couple of losses, you'll still probably get in. You could, you know, of course, you could win your conference and get in too. FSU, it's great news for you, especially after you got screwed last year. And, uh, and other teams that have a legitimate shot. Now, we're going to have a group of five get in. As you know, the highest ranked conference champion of the group of five gets into the top 12, which is going to creak a really good team. There's going to be it, and I hope it's not my Vols, because I will not be happy. But – Eventually, we're going to go to 14 and then to 16. But you're going to see, mark my words, the excitement level towards the end of this season is going to build and build and build, and it's going to be fantastic. And for my Vols, I couldn't be happier. Now, we're going through spring practice right now, and I know there's a lot of teams that are pumped. I know uh, I heard Kentucky's all fired up about Brock Vandergriff, and I completely understand that five-star guy that was sitting behind um, Carson Beck at Georgia. Now, he's going to be the starter for Kentucky. I know you're excited. For us, we couldn't be more pumped. We've got uh, Nico Iamaliava, who I think is going to be one of the top quarter. I think he will be in the Heisman running this year. Just based on what I've seen, I know we've only got a small uh, sample, but he was the number one player in the country in recruiting, and he has not disappointed. He played in one game. And if you'll notice, this is important to remember. How many freshmen played in the bowl game? Well, Ohio State wound up with their freshman five-star because their starter hit the transfer portal. Their backup got hurt early in the first quarter, so they put in their five-star freshman. He didn't do anything against Missouri. They didn't score a, but three points. Florida State had to put their freshman in because their starter got hurt, which creaked him out of the CFP. Their backup hit the transfer portal because he knew he wasn't going to have the starting job moving forward, so they put in their freshman. He didn't do, he scored three points. We put in our freshman, we scored 35 points and won 35 to nothing. And he scored four touchdowns. It is incredibly hard for a true freshman to go out and perform well in his very first ball game. And ours did it against a top 10 defense. So that's why I'm so excited about Nico. Now, the other reason to be excited for us Vols, James Pierce, number one edge rusher in the country. We have the best defensive line that we've had in a long time. It is thick. I'm telling you, we've got speed on the edges, we've got strength in the middle, and we've got a lot of depth. And we have the best defensive line coach in the country under Rodney Garner. So the strength of this team this year will obviously be the defensive line, quarterback play, need to keep him healthy, and the two areas that I am concerned about, and it will probably be this way for a while, is offensive line and defensive backfield. Now, offensive line, we're good as far as starters go. I feel pretty confident, especially getting Lance Hurd in there. And uh, I think he is just a plug-and-play guy. Big-time five-star, already played one year in the SEC. He just couldn't break through as a starter at LSU because they had two all-SEC caliber uh, tackles that were two and three years older than him. 
Well, I think he's found his home here. We got John Campbell on the other tackle. We're good there. And then, of course, we got Cooper as center. So I think keeping them healthy will be critical. As far as who's going to back him up, it's very important that we have a backup for our center position. And I know Vice and Lang's one guy they're talking about, Max Adderson, Satterwhite, et cetera. So uh, they're working on that as we speak. But the offensive line, I think, will be okay there. The defensive backfield is all brand new. We had a bunch of three stars for the last three years. They have not performed well. Seven of them left last year. And none of I don't think the coaches tried to keep any of them. They, they pretty much walked out and they said, see you later. And that's nothing against them. I'm sure they did the best they could. But three stars across the board in your secondary in the SEC is not a good situation. And it has been our Achilles heel all for the last three years. Well, this year, it's all four stars back there, and it's all proven commodities. So, yeah, we saw one game with them, and they didn't allow a point. I understand that, but that was against Iowa. And for you Iowa Hawkeye fans, and I've got some of you now because you're always commenting, you're not going to want to hear this. Just Just walk walk away. away. Yeah, listen to Humongous. Your offense sucks. I've never seen a worse offense in my life than what I saw in that bowl game. It was pitiful. The quarterback play was, and I know your starting quarterback was hurt early in the year, so I get it, but that was the most non-creative offense I've ever seen. It was ridiculous. Our defensive backfield didn't allow a point. Think about that. Everybody scored on our defensive backfield, except you. So I know you've got a good defense, but you've got to do something about that offense. It's pitiful. But I'm I'm hearing really good things about um, Jermon McCoy, who is a proven uh, player. Hearing good things about Tarantine and um, several other players in the defensive backfield. That's really my concern is how well will they play. We've got some big-time four-stars back there. Ricky Gibson, I think we'll see him. Jordan Thomas. Uh, We've got several players back there that were very highly recruited and should uh, perform well. So I think we're going to be okay, but we're probably going to go through some growing pains because a lot of these guys are going to be sophomores and really haven't had a ton of playing time. And we're going to have to mesh in some new players they got out of the transfer portal. So that's really the only concern I have is defensive backfield. That's a serious concern. But I do know we've got the talent. We've got the length back there for the first time in three years under Josh Heupel. And I know we'll be able to stop the run. We should be able to put a ton of pressure on the quarterbacks, which is great. I couldn't be happier with our quarterback position. Running backs, I think, will take care of itself. And I know that uh, Cam Seldon is hurt right now, shoulder surgery, and uh, they have another player that had shoulder surgery as well. But with Dylan Sampson, and of course we've got, you know, it's not a thin uh, backfield at all. And the way Josh Heupel sets up his offense, we're normally going up against five and six in the box, and that allows you to run the ball. We have run the ball beautifully over the last three years. Actually, a lot of people think that all we do is throw the ball. The truth is we run the ball a ton and it sets up the pass. And we're going to see a lot of that this year. And, of course, we also have a dual-threat quarterback. The thing about Nico, three of his touchdowns in the Citrus Bowl were with his legs. He's basically a tall Bryce Young. That's what he is. I think he's going to play like Hendon Hooker, though, as far as stats, but he's going to look a lot more like Bryce Young. Now, had Hendon Hooker been our quarterback for the next 30 years, that would have been fine with me. It's rare to have a guy that is that efficient and that clutch But I tell you, I've got uh, high hopes for Nico, that's for sure. Now, we haven't talked about receivers. I'm pumped about our receivers. Obviously, Squirrel White. And uh, Brew McCoy coming back is huge. But we've brought in some new guys with Brazil, of course, Mike Matthews, uh, Thornton. I tell you what, don't be surprised if he doesn't have a resurgence this year. A lot of it has to do with the quarterback that really, when they have confidence that the quarterback's going to put it where it needs to be, you'd be surprised what happens with receivers. We saw that a lot with Hinn and Hooker. You know, he, uh, he took uh, Cedric Tillman and, um, and Jalen Hyatt to all new highs because they knew he was going to throw the ball to them with touch. And you're going to see that with Nico. As far as a backup quarterback, Gaston Moore is obviously our backup quarterback. He's a fifth-year senior. He knows all. He knows the offense backwards and forwards. The only person that knows the offense better is probably Josh Heupel. So I think we're fine there as far as a backup. I don't see Jake Merklinger being the backup. I know he's a solid four-star that came in as a freshman. 
I don't want a freshman as a backup. That's a mistake. Unless he's some superstar like Nico. As far as recruiting goes, let's take a look at recruiting. And we'll take a look at the rankings here in a minute. But obviously we got uh, George McIntyre, who is a five-star. Every time in the comments, oh, he's not a five-star. I don't care what ESPN thinks about his rating. They don't know crap about recruiting. Everybody else has got him as a five-star. ESPN. Number 10 player in the country. Then Ethan Utley uh, just uh, committed a nice uh, defensive lineman I think will uh, do well for us. And then we've got a couple of nice solid uh, four-stars there and some three-stars. And we're sitting at number, uh, I believe, 14. Let's see. All right. As far as team rankings concerned, of course, Ohio State's sitting at number one. They've got 11 recruits. We've only got seven. But here's what's important. The average rating, they're sitting at 93, so that's really strong. LSU, they're obviously, God, three five-stars. Jeez, they're sitting at 93. USC has been kicking booty. they got two five-stars. Clemson, they normally sit around 91. They've got 11. Here's Notre Dame. They've got 19. They've got by far the most, but their average is under 90, so that's not really a concern. This is a little concerning uh, for Alabama. They're sitting at 91. They're normally around 93 in that neighborhood. But with Kalen DeBoer and they don't have their uh, – Recruiting guru in Nick Saban. We'll see how that plays out. Here's Florida State sitting at 92. That's a really nice number. If they can stick around 92, they'll end up in the top 10 easy. Georgia, they're just getting rolling here. They're sitting at 91. They'll end up in the top three, guaranteed. Here's Auburn sitting around 90. Let's see. We're number 12 on on three. We're sitting at 90. We normally finish around 91. Oregon's at 91. Texas, is. they usually end up about 92 or higher. And Tennessee's got a bunch of recruits coming in uh, this weekend. The biggest one being David Sanders, the number one offensive lineman in the country. He is obviously buddies with George McIntyre, and McIntyre's recruiting him heavy. So that would be a huge pickup for us. I believe he's the number two player in the country. So uh, I know they're going to be pushing hard for him. Clemson's big time in, the, uh, in his ear as well. And, of course, Georgia and Alabama and everybody. We also have several other offensive linemen coming in this weekend because we're going to lose a bunch of our offensive linemen at the end of this year, and we're going to need to refill. they got a fellow by the name of Douglas Utu, who's a top 100 offensive lineman, Nick Brooks, another offensive lineman, and so on and so forth. So you're going to see a huge push this year for O-line, and I would say we'll probably take in four or five in this uh, class because we have not had a bunch of great offensive linemen come in over the last few years, especially in 21 and 22. So that's why we're going to be thin. As a matter of fact, we got a lot of the uh, six-year seniors, the super seniors, because of the uh, virus and all that crap. So this weekend's pretty important. Now, granted, it's hard to really – recruiting has changed so much. It used to be February was the big signing day. Now it's really December. I think it's the third week of December. So everything's pushed way up, and a lot of these guys like to get it out of the way. They like to go ahead and commit before they even start their season. So it turns out June, July, and August winds up being huge in the summer as far as getting commitments. So I know Tennessee's really pushing hard right now. So we'll keep track of that as well. Now I want to talk about something that's happened to ESPN, and that's Pat McAfee. Now, I know some of you aren't huge fans of his. I, I can take him or leave him. I think he does a good job. And I can certainly respect what he's built up over the years. But he just took down a big dog at ESPN that had been sabotaging him, allegedly. And that's a Norby Williamson guy. Says, Pat McAfee wins power struggle as ESPN dumps executive accused of sabotaging the popular show. And when Pat McAfee came over from YouTube, the guy was getting tons of views. I mean, big time views. Even during live, he'd have 30, 40, 50, 60,000 people watching, which is unheard of especially in sports. You know, I'm happy if I've got 500 people watching when I do a live. <laughs> and this guy had tens of thousands. Well, this Norby dude, and that's his real name, uh, was not happy because Pat McAfee shows up. He's sleeveless sometimes. He uses some profanity every now and again, and he gets super upset over anything like that. He wants you in a suit and tie, buttoned up, and he wants you to follow the company line. And you'd better say all the right things. And as you know, ESPN, for whatever reason, stopped being truly sports and started getting into politics, which is never a good idea to do. If you've noticed on this channel, I don't do politics. This is a sports channel. That's what I talk about. ESPN decided to get in the middle of that, and they lost a ton of viewers over it. 
And it doesn't matter whether you choose the left or the right. You're going to lose a huge portion of your audience when you do that. Well, that's what ESPN chose to do. So they tried to bring in Pat McAfee, who's just the everyday guy that anybody can relate to. And Norby didn't care for that because he wants things to say the way they are. Well, the problem is their ratings have sucked. And when your ratings suck, you don't make enough money. And if you don't make enough money, it's hard to pay the Norbies of the world. Well, he, he lived in a bubble where as long as I'm getting my paycheck, I got nothing to worry about. You don't get a paycheck anymore, Norby. Said uh, McAfee called Williamson a rat, and we covered that. He was ticked off because he was going around uh, saying that his ratings sucked and uh, was leaking stuff out to his buddies in the media. And Norby was supposed to stay all the way through 2027, but obviously the uh, CEO there said, no, I, we're going to stick with Pat McAfee and we're going to get rid of you. Logical. Says Williamson was not a fan of bringing a YouTube star into a traditional TV setting. A civil war started, and it was clear from the early stages of the conflict that McAfee felt he held all the cards, and many doubted that was the case. It says McAfee turned out to be correct because he's the face of ESPN now, and they're positioning him as the future, and Norby is gone. And it talks about the classic example, if you come at the king, you best not miss. That's right, if you go after the king, you better get him, because if you don't, you're going to the dungeon or worse. It's good to be the king. Now, again, whether you're a Pat McAfee fan or you're not, this is a good sign for ESPN because they're breaking away from all of that and trying to get back to just the regular folks. Now, we all watched ESPN years ago. I used to watch it consistently, always watch the highlights and all the fun stuff, Glenn Largemouth Bass and, uh, and Eric living with the enemy. <laughs> and so on and so forth. We all remember those days. And that was when ESPN was super fun because it was just sports. It sounds like they're trying to get back to that. And with Pat McAfee, that's pretty much what you're going to get unless he brings on Aaron Rodgers. Then you might get into some politics or some things that some of these networks don't like. But here's the thing. He's irreverent and likes to have fun. So that's going to cause some consternation there at ESPN. But it sounds like they're making a decision that, you know what? We're doing terrible right now. Our ratings are in the tank. We've got to mix it up a little bit. And really, McAfee's not got great ratings over there. He was doing better on YouTube. Now, uh, again, I'm going to reiterate, this I think is going to be the greatest college football season that we've ever had. And it's going to be very new for a lot of teams to have a legitimate chance to get into that 12-team playoff. And it's going to make so many of the games towards the end incredibly important. First of all, for your big-time schools that are used to being in the top four, which is your Georgia, Ohio State, uh, Alabama, we'll see about Alabama this year, and so on and so forth, those teams, they're going to need to stay in the top four to get that by. So it's very all their games are very important. The next four get home field advantage, which is huge. Yeah, you don't get a by, but you get to play at Neyland, for example, or whatever stadium your team plays. That's huge. That's worth at least a touchdown. At least a touchdown, especially in a playoff scenario where the crowd's going to be out of their mind. And then the 9 through 12, you're just going to be glad you're in because every other year you'd have been out. And that's going to really bring a lot of teams into the equation that we hadn't really seen in the playoff. And I keep coming up with Penn State and the Big Ten, Tennessee, Ole Miss, LSU, Texas, Texas A&M, all these – I know Texas was in last year – but they haven't been in a very long time. All these teams are going to have a legitimate shot of getting in, and that's monstrous. So I think this is the most pumped I've been about a uh, college football season, and I can't remember when. Really, it might have been during the former days. And with our offense, the way we play, that, that quick tempo, which is unbelievably exciting to watch. And you're going to have the Cinderella's. And <laughs> I'm going to tell you what, when you get into that one-and-done situation, anything can happen. We may start seeing – a lot more teams winning national titles other than the big four that have been winning it for the last decade, which I think is going to be great for college football, and it's going to drive ratings. It's going to bring in more money, more excitement, and I think it'll be good long term. I know there's some people out there who don't like it. I understand. I get the old school, but uh, I think you'll see by the end of this year that it's going to be amazing. If you like this content, be sure to hit that like button. Let's continue to cover all these big college stories and sports, etc., and if you've not subscribed, it's right here on your right, my left. Hit this little button. I'd appreciate it. And right over here is the most recent video. YouTube thinks you'll enjoy. We'll see you next time on Sports Talk Jay.